In this video, I'm going to pick up right where I left off in the first one. We'll be diving into the internal structure of the hosts and home directories of my Nix config and wrap up the entire structure at the end with a quick summary. If you haven't seen the first video, you can check it out here. So the next output is a big one. It contains all of the host level configurations, all of the system specific settings for each distinct system controlled by the configuration. Maybe it's one system, maybe it's multiple. For this example, we have two hosts defined here, ghost.nix, which is my desktop computer, and gusto.nix, which is my theater. As new host systems are added to the config, each system will get its own file here to define all of the NixOS packages to install and configure for it, as well as which users to create. We're going to go into more detail about how the host-specific configuration is structured, but first we'll talk about the last output directory, which is the home manager configurations. So again, with all of the system-level configurations stored at the host level, all of the user-level preferences are stored at the home level. You could think of this as where your dot files are written. So for this example, I've got home configurations for two users. The first is TA, my personal user account, which is present on both the desktop host and the theater host. And second, I have a media account, which is a basic read-only user that is present only on the theater. The idea here being that anyone in my house can use the theater with a basic user account that can open a web browser or media player to stream videos. But if I need to do some administrative tasks, that only happens with my personal account. You'll see that within my home slash TA directory, I have a config for Ghost and a separate one for Gusto. The reason for this is that I don't need to have the vast majority of packages and preferences set up on my theater that I do for my desktop. So I can define specifics for each host, but whenever I do use a package on both hosts, the setting I configure can be identical. Obviously, with the case of media, it's only present on Gusto, so it only needs a single host file. A quick note here, host or system level configs are also often referred to as NixOS configs. The reason for this is that in a default NixOS configuration, you have a configuration.nix file for your NixOS settings and a home.nix file for your home manager settings. But once a configuration grows or some better organization is desired, those files quickly get split out into many others. So now we have a good overview of the rough anatomy. We know that our system level configs live in the host directory and our user level preferences live in the home directory using host specific files. We'll expand on the structure of the hosts directory by adding some more space to the diagram and focus on this area. We have two hosts defined here, ghost.nix, which is my desktop computer and gusto.nix, which is my theater. What do these configs actually do? So as you can imagine, there will be some significant differences in configuration for these two hosts, but there will also be some overlap. For example, on my desktop, I might have Audacity, the program I'm recording this audio with, but I wouldn't have a need for that on my theater host. However, I'll likely have the same browser, possibly the same Windows manager, and definitely some of the same users. Wherever I can, I want these to be configured the same way on all hosts to avoid duplicate config files while benefiting from the consistent experience across my network. To organize this, I'll use a common directory. And within that, I'll have a subdirectory for each user on the network. As I mentioned, I've got TA, my personal user, and media, read-only user that anyone in my house can use to watch media on the theater box. All of the configuration settings for how these users should be created, what their passwords and other secrets might be, and importantly, what home manager configurations to reference from the home section are included in these files. Any distinct users that would need to be created on a given system would be added here. The next common subdirectory is core, and this includes configurations for any non-user system level settings that are present or required on all of the hosts in my network. This is going to include things like my localization defaults. I happen to live in Canada and speak English, so that'll be common on all of my systems until I move the hell out of here and learn another language. It will also have some NixOS specific configs like garbage collection in the nix.nix file. Services such as SSH, SOPs for secrets management, and my basic shell settings. All of these are settings and packages that regardless of what system on my network I'm using, I expect to be present and to be the same. Now, the last common subdirectory is optional, which includes all of the other system level configs. Some of these might appear on one system and not others. Some may appear on all hosts, but they're not considered part of core because you might know that an additional host down the road definitely won't require it. So for example, this is where I would put a browser, a Windows manager, an SMTP server, streaming tools, Pipewire for audio, Steam for gaming, VLC for playing media, 
These are all packages and settings that won't be needed on all of my hosts. So I'm going to briefly talk about a simple but important self-imposed design constraint. Core is meant specifically for settings that occur across all hosts that are handled by the config. If something does not occur on all hosts, then it's not a part of core. It's optional, period. I've seen several configs on GitHub now that have a common core or a common base, and they likely started out that way, but sure as shit, there are exceptions to the rule for some hosts. Now, you can do whatever you want, but as soon as you make an exception to the rule, you'll be adding unneeded inconsistency to your configuration. To me, it will defeat the entire purpose of having a common core in the first place. You might as well just dump everything into common at that point. Things will change over time though, and if something in core isn't required on a host for some reason, you can just move it to optional and update the configs. And the reverse is true too. You might find that something you considered as optional is important enough to have on all of your hosts. So move it to core, and it will be pulled in with the same group instead of needing a distinct reference in each host file. This is something I impose on myself, and at times it requires a little bit of concession, but it will pay off in the end, and I recommend you give it a try. Design constraints like this are important for organization. Give it a try or don't, but I suspect that if you're watching this video and you've gotten this far, you're interested in being more organized and not less. Now that we understand the structure of common host configurations, let's take a simple look at how the two example hosts will reference the common configs. So starting with Ghost, it will pull in only the TA user, since I'm the only one who uses that host. Next, it will pull in all of the common core configs in a single import. And finally, it will pull in all the optional packages. This is just to make the diagram a little less messy in a moment, but let's assume for example's sake that all of the configs that are considered optional happen to be used on the desktop host. Now let's see how Gusto is different considering it's a special purpose host. First, it will pull in both the TA user for admin and management purposes and the media user for regular everyday use as a theater. Then, just like with Ghost, it will pull in all of the common core as a single import. And lastly, where we can be more selective in optional, we're just going to pull in browser for streaming, the Windows manager, Pipewire for audio, and VLC for playing other media. Now that we understand the anatomy for the system level host configurations, let's take a closer look at the user preferences and home configurations. As mentioned before, each of the user files created under hosts slash common slash users will reference a home slash user slash host config file. We'll make some more space for the substructure and look at the TA user, which has a configuration for desktop and a configuration for theater. The commonality of the settings that was true to hosts configurations is also true to home configurations. As a user, I'm likely to want to use the same personal preferences across most, if not all of the systems I use. So we'll start the substructure with another common directory, and that common directory will also have its own core that is always used for this user regardless of which host they are on. This would include things like your environment variables, fonts, personal git config, your primary editor settings, and your personal shell configuration. Regardless of what system I'm accessing with this user, I want these settings to be consistent and available. And likewise, we'll also use a common optional subdirectory for personal configurations that don't occur on all hosts. And here, for brevity's sake, I'm including my personal Windows Manager configuration with things like wallpaper, theme, and tile decorations would be declared. And I've also included signal in the diagram here, but haven't actually added that to my configuration yet and realized after the fact that signal doesn't have any options supported by Home Manager. So let's pretend it's Spotify instead. Now for the media user, we don't actually need a lot of individual preferences since it's a basic read-only user. So I'm just going to define everything I need in the home slash media slash gusto.nix file itself. Now that we have the home directory structure laid out, let's take a quick look at how TA's various home configs will be referenced. For the desktop system, we'll obviously import the entire TA slash common slash core. And since my desktop is the primary computer that has all the things, we'll also import the entire optional subdirectory. For the theater host, however, I'll only ever be accessing it with TA for admin tasks, so I'll only need what's in the core. Okay, so let's recap everything about the Nix config from both videos. The flake.nix file is our central staging area that pulls in all of our external dependencies. These include URIs to official package sources, potentially unofficial sources, and other flakes. The inputs are then used by the Flake outputs, which includes all of our custom NixOS or Home Manager modules, any overlays or custom packages we've written, a development shell in Nix formatter, 
all of our system level host configuration settings to define what users get created and how each system should be configured. And lastly, all of our user level home manager configuration settings to define individual user preferences across the hosts. Even if you don't use all of the elements of the anatomy, such as overlays or custom modules, knowing how they are distinguished and organized should be helpful when the time comes or when referring to other public configs that follow a similar structure. There's additional info in the description below, including a link to my next config on GitHub, where you can find a screenshot of the diagram as well as the most recent iteration of it that follows the current state of my config. Please let me know in the comments if you found this helpful or there's something more you'd like to know about it, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for your time, and remember, the way out is through.